Hey, this is Man Made Mead, and welcome to episode number nine of the podcast. This is What's New with Mead, and uh, I'm, of course, your host, Man Made Mead. I'm excited to um, share some things that have been going on, of course, in my brew house, and uh, talk to you guys about the main topic of uh, a traditional mead. I am in my own mead making experience going through a traditional mead, what I'll call a complex, in that I have made a lot of mead in the past, and as I looked through my whole uh, archive of everything I've made, I realized the less than 10% of the things I've made have been traditional meads, which is kind of weird. Uh, so we're going to talk about that. What's the traditional mead complex? And um, we'll get that, get to that in, uh, in part two. So uh, I always do these in a specific way. Um, I got three parts to my podcast. Um, the first one, kind of prompting this topic today, is um, what I'm drinking for right now. This is, and if you're on, a, of course, the podcast, Spotify, Apple Podcast, you can't see, but I'm holding a glass of uh, Martin Brothers Winery Lucerne Blossom Mead. So I, first of all, have never heard, had never heard of Lucerne Blossom uh, honey. I've also never tried it uh, until now, of course. And um, I'm going to be sipping on this, but this thing's fantastic. It's a traditional mead. And it again, it really prompted this idea for me because I realized as a mead maker, I need to, of course, be branching out a little bit and making more um, traditionals because that's kind of the, the bare bones. That's the bottom of the pyramid for mead making. Of course, you get to the top, you get to do all your crazy stuff. Um, and I think I, in some ways, I've spent more time at the top than at the bottom. So um, this thing is super fantastic. I, I just, I've tasted it a little bit. It has an amazing, very crisp honey character between a floral and earthy note. It also, uh, Lucerne Blossom Honey was interesting to me because I'd never heard of it. It has a very, uh, smoke not very slightly smoky taste to it so on the bottle for this thing it says um some of the aromas are like clove and cinnamon so uh baking spices is what they call it and what they are but that's what you get on the nose and the same thing what's interesting to me with that is uh this is a traditional mead so they didn't add cinnamon or clove you just get those natural smells from um that varietal honey of uh, you know, lucerne blossom, which is kind of interesting. Uh, I don't know what yeast they use. Used. I know that they uh, that this thing's a fourteen percent, and I know it's it's good. Um, it's got a great honey smell to it as well. I also can tell you that that the um, as far as like tasting it, the um, it's very it's very fruity esque in that that. Uh, smokiness that I talked about from the honey uh, itself is prompting like a the what they say on the bottle as a grilled apple um, taste. I would I kind of categorize a little bit as an apple, more so like pineapple. Um, it's got this very tropical esque thing. So I was very inspired when I tried this because I went okay. I want to make something. I want to make a traditional mead that is this good, and it. Uh, it is sweet, of course. I think that helps with honey character. I think that helps bolster honey character when you back sweeten a little bit. Of course, you can get honey character through a dry mead. I think a dry mead needs longer time to age to really, um, really get to that uh, honey honey character realm that you want. So this is what I'm going to be sipping on, and. Um, I'm very enthused by it. If uh, you want to go check them out, go check them out. Smart Brothers Winery. Um, this is the Lucerne Blossom uh, Mead. So let's get to part two. Let's talk about the traditional mead complex. Now, what do I mean by that? Um, I kind of explained it a moment ago. Traditional meads, as I've seen in my own mead making experience, and as, as, as I've seen in maybe some other people's experience, are a little difficult to make. And uh, I kind of want to talk about why that is. I have some theories. Um, I don't necessarily have factual evidence um, saying that, you know, 100, you know, 98 out of 100 people have agreed with this statement. These are just my own theories, so please don't get too angry and, and 
frustrated with me for having my own theories. But one of my biggest theories for why a traditional mead is difficult to make is simply the fact that you're relying completely on the honey to provide all of this uh, character of the mead. It is literally the main, other than water, the main ingredient of the mead. Of course, we can go into the discussion for yeast and those things. I don't want to talk about that yet. We will talk about that here in a few minutes. But the honey is your biggest source of flavor. Um, so when you're buying your honey, one of my things I want to recommend to you, if you've never made a mead or, of course, if you have made a mead, make sure you are buying high-quality honey. That means that you're not buying the thing called honey sauce that you get at you know, Costco, which I don't think they even sell that. But if it doesn't say stuff like 100% honey, uh, raw, unfiltered, anything like that information, probably don't buy it. And that's because any honey that doesn't have that information, like honey sauce, for example, is really like 50% honey and then like 50% maybe like corn syrup or water or something that's not honey. So you're, you're automatically going to lose your character, your flavors of honey if you use that in your own mead making. Um, and I, I want to warn you, caution you, like if you're going to make a mead, buy high quality ingredients first. Don't try and skimp your way through it. It just won't work. It's not worth it. So that's step number one, tip number one. And that can be part of the problem with making a traditional mead if you're not using high quality honey. And I think that in the past, I've used some decent quality honey. I have some um, bulk suppliers I like to use. I used Dutch Gold Honey for a long time. I haven't used them as much recently because I found a different website that I like a little bit more. It's called Webstront, I think, .com. And um, they do bulk honey. But for me, it was cheaper uh, for shipping. So I, I went with them because I was like, okay, well, I don't want to deal with paying a ton of money for shipping because 60 pounds to ship is pretty expensive. So uh, I found some pretty good honey from them. I've been using some orange blossom honey from them recently. It's really good stuff. Uh, I've been using it for some tests and it's it tastes great. It's fermented really well and it's put out some pretty high quality meads. Like five feet away from me right now is a, an entire six gallon uh, container of orange blossom mead from that honey. So I, I really like Florida orange or just orange blossom honey in general because of the notes it gives. It's, of course, citrusy and it's, of course, very floral, but it, it provides a really nice full body from what I've experienced, too. So the, the complex part number one of this is uh, you have to, of course, when making a traditional mead, have a solid honey to use. And if you don't, you might end up with something that's not as great. And that's just because you're depending completely on the honey to provide the character, the floral notes, the smoky notes, whatever you're trying to get out of said mead. So now, what are some other complex ideas for making a traditional? Um, in my opinion, a traditional mead, in every one of them I tasted at least, has always had at least a semi-sweet to a sweet finish. And um, if you've ever tried a traditional mead, there's this idea in mead making that is uh, sweetness sells. And I think that can go for wine sometimes in some categories. But that, that idea of like people enjoy something that's a little more sweet than it than dry. Now, that's not true for everybody. Someone in the comments right now is going, oh, my gosh, no, I enjoy dry stuff. Sweet stuff sucks. That's that's fine. Uh, I think if we're talking about about the majority of um, mead making, you're probably going to see more people liking sweet stuff. So when you are making a traditional mead, you can, of course, do it dry if you want to, and that's fine. Um, I will, I'm will. i starting to add a little more honey to my traditionals for not only the reason of back sweetening, but also to help bolster the honey character. If you think about when you ferment in the primary um, of, a, of a mead, you are probably going to lose some of that honey character, um, the aromas, um, even the tastes, uh, during that primary fermentation. And that's simply because the yeast are fermenting. The air that's coming out of the airlock is CO2, and it is, it is stuff that needs to leave the meat in general, yes. But it is also the, um, the honey's aroma 
which is a huge part of the taste. So uh, if you are putting honey into the secondary, you're bolstering that, um, that taste again. One thing that they did really well with this, this uh, lucerne blossom mead, they got it up to 14%, and then either they back sweetened or they started off in their primary with more honey than the, or more gravity than the yeast could handle, then they just went back and simply, um, or they just let it go, and then there's residual sweetness. I don't know which side of the fence they landed on, but they've retained great honey character because of that. If you want a little tip to help you out in your mead making, try to put a little, either more honey than your yeast can handle, if you're willing to accept a mead that is 14 plus percent, or um, go through a, some different processes of stopping and stabilizing that mead and then allowing for residual sweetness to be there. You can, of course, back sweeten. Um, I don't want to get into that category today because that's a, a rabbit hole in itself. And um, while I enjoy you know, getting to get into those things, I'll talk about them a different time. But that complex of, of uh, bolstering honey character in a uh, traditional mead actually does... A lot. It really helps. Um, so if you can add a little bit, even a tiny amount of honey, not necessarily a super sweet mead, uh, not make a super sweet mead, if you can add a little honey to bolster that character, go for it. That's part of the complex I see. Another complex I want to talk about is, um, is something I've seen as I have been trying more commercial meads. Um, of course there are people making, I, I immediately think of uh, crafted artisan meadery, that are making some wild meads. You know, uh, there's one I tried, it was like a mango habanero, that's not necessarily super wild. Um, there's a one called Bananas Foster Forever, and that one's a banana mead. What else has there been? Uh, there have been a bunch of different meads that have more than just the honey, water, and yeast in them. And that's by no means a cop-out, by no means something me bashing using that, because guess what? A, 90% of my meads have been stuff, honey, water, yeast, plus something else. What I'm trying to say is that um, the the bulk of the meaderies slash wineries that I've seen have been putting out traditional meads and doing them really well. And that is because I think that they have mastered the use of honey and don't necessarily have to, um, I'm at least putting it in my mean making perspective, they don't need, they don't always need to put extra ingredients in there to try and bolster character of a mead. They're doing great things with just the honey. And that's kind of what's inspired me to try and be better at making traditional meads, because I would love to be able to make a traditional mead that's good by itself. I think that's a to me, a test of a truly good mead, ma mead maker is if you can make a mead that uh, is is good without any extra ingredients. So that I've noticed that, at least with commercial breweries, commercial wineries and meaderies, that the traditional side for them is also is often really, really good. Now, there are still lots of people making wild, crazy different meads, and that's awesome. I'm all for trying different recipes. Um, I feel like I think one of my first like 15 recipes was a peppermint mead. Like the first, one of the first things I decided to do was take this thing and run with it and go to a crazy direction. Um, but as I'm finding a couple of years later, I want to try and also be good at the basics. So this idea of a traditional mead complex is mainly wrapping around the idea that using honey, solely using honey is actually a little bit more difficult um, than using a bunch of different other recipes um, or uh, ingredients. Again, I'm not pushing down anybody who's using a bunch of fruits or anything like that. Please, like, go make all the different kinds of meads you want to make. My uh, encouragement to you is for you to go through and try to make some traditional meads. If you have been someone like me who has made 70 plus recipes now and less than 10% of your meads have been um, traditionals, you should probably up that number a little bit to maybe 25%. Um, and I, I just think that's really interesting. So w there's a subcategory of this. It's not a traditional mead, but it is uh, uh, one of my favorite types of meads, and that is a boche. So some people might argue that a boche is a traditional mead, which I 
think you could be partially right, to be honest, uh, in that you're relying solely on the honey character to provide the flavor for your mead. However, there, if you know anything about a boche, the process by which you make a boche kind of takes away the traditional esque ness of it. Um, a boche is where you are heating honey to, uh, you know, caramelize certain sugars in within that honey, which then make them non-fermentable in a mead. And naturally, that has some, I'll say, consequences for the yeast. Um, it does change some of the compound of your, your uh, not yeast, but your mead, in that um, whenever you are caramelizing those sugars, you are making it some things harder for the yeast to chew on, so they don't have as much nutrient to uh, devour. So you might have to put more nutrients into a boche in order to make it uh, better. Um, and I, again, I don't want to go too in, de in depth with this, but basically what I'm trying to say is a boche uh, does in some manner qualify as a traditional mead. It is a different style of mead in itself. Uh, if you are wanting to, or I'll say this, as I'm getting better, wanting to get better at making um, traditional meads, I'm also looking at the other side and saying, how can I be better at making boches? Because they're absolutely one of my favorite meads to make. And that's because they provide such an interesting character and um, side of, of honey because there are ferment non-fermentable sugars providing residual sweetness, which is, again, what we talked about with the traditional mead uh, complex a little bit. Um, you're getting a little bit more of a sweeter mead. You're also getting different characters. A lot of my boches have come out with a, um, like a smoky flavor kind of, but also a uh, more whiskey-esque note to it. And I really like that. I like whiskey. Whiskey is one of my favorite spirits. Um, probably one of the only spirits I really drink, to be quite honest with you. Uh, but that's that's okay. I am um, I'm trying to get better at making boches and traditionals. I, of course, am continuing to make my various other recipes. Um, I, I do want to kind of transition to a different subtopic. We've, of course, talked about this main, main topic of uh, traditional meads and making them the complex you see there. And then a boche is a little bit. My other thing I want to um, I want to share with you guys is that you should be, um, number one, writing down your recipes. Let's say you've made a mead, and the moment you start it, you need to sit down and write down, okay, I put three gallons of water in it, nine pounds of um, orange blossom honey, a lavender D47, five grams of lavender D47, yada, yada. Write down like your primary, all that information, because you want to be able to reference in the future how long things took to ferment, um, what you did to get to a certain point. Let's say um, at this point I have made like five or six versions of my apple and cinnamon mead. Let's say that I'm, I'm thinking about it and going, okay, well my batch number three was my favorite. If I have written down uh, how I got to the end of batch number three, then I can be able to recreate it to some effect. Of course, if you have uh, temperature fluctuations, all of that stuff, you might have some different issues. But if you have the step-by-step -step process, so write down your things. That's my first tip in that regard. But my next tip is going to be to um, make some staple meads. Like find your five favorite meads that you've made and continue to make maybe even small batches of them and test different things, tweak things, add more fruit, add less fruit, add less honey, add, you know, just various stuff like that. So that if you, um, as you make your mead, you are starting to make your best stuff. In my experience, as I've given bottles out to friends, um, I'm starting to get to the point where people are going, hey, I really like that. In the beginning, when I handed things out, um, and you know, I don't fault them at all for this, I was not always getting responses for one, or uh, I think most people are nice enough to say like, oh, thank you for the bottle, you know, but uh, I was not getting raving reviews, and that's okay. Um, what I have seen, though, is the people who have tried my multi-batch things, like my apple and cinnamon, have noticed, oh, that honey character is getting, is better. So if you will continue to play around with your recipes, you will start to make better 
uh, more consistent meads for one, but two, you'll make uh, better meads in general. So I, I think that that has been part of my goal. At this point, I have five or six recipes that I really like to make, and um, I'm hoping that if I can continue down that road, and of course experiment, but then find more recipes that I like that are standards, I will be able to do more with it in the future, make more of those meads to pass out to friends, to get them to be interested in mead drinking and mead making, possibly. Um, but also, if I wanted to go further with this and wanted to do uh, open my own winery, meadery, something in that regard, um, I would have things to start with. So if you're in that same boat as me and you're going, man, I'd really like to make this more than a hobby, make sure you're diligently writing down, um, regardless if it's a hobby or not, you're diligently writing down your information and that you're experimenting. Because one, it's fun. Two, you need it. You need to be doing that stuff to continue to get better. So uh, I, I love, I'm starting to really fall in love with traditional meads. I wasn't as big of a fan of them before. And I think it's because one, I was not trying a bunch of commercial meads. So I wasn't tasting kind of the best of the best, quite frankly. But two, when I was drinking my own traditional meads, I had not made stuff that was like fantastic. So my first thought when I tried a traditional mead was, oh, this thing's not very good. And it's like, well, if I throw some apples in it, that'll make it better. Well, then that takes away the traditional side. It's like, oh, now you have a mellow mouth. So trying to get better at the traditional mead side is going to be interesting. And I hope you will join me in the conquest to try and um, make better meads in that regard. Okay, let's get to section three or part three of this podcast. I always like to talk about some like mean mistakes, mean successes that I have made or had in the past um, week or so. Also, I want to try and add something into this and give kind of like a little pro tip or, you know, a... Um, a tip in general for mead making. So I have been testing things with half gallon mason jars recently um, to make smaller amounts of mead for one and do test stuff. So like if I wanted to test uh, a specific flavoring in a mead instead of dumping it in my five gallon, pull it into a half gallon. So first of all, go, if you can, go to Walmart, get on Amazon, buy yourself some half gallon um, little uh, mason jars, um, or, you know, you can find some, just look up half gallon brewing, um, equipment on Amazon and, uh, get yourself a couple of those so that you can separate out half a gallon of mead and then go crazy Add all the stuff you want to do and, you know, do that. I have been doing that. And that's kind of where my mead mistake has come in, um, recently. And I want to forewarn you with something. If, you are going to make a half gallon mead in that half gallon container. When you rack over into another half gallon container, guess what? You're probably going to have sediment. You're probably going to have lost some mead, which then gives you some headspace. So uh, I knew this was going to happen, but then after testing a couple things and going, well, crap, now I have to deal with this, um, I have decided to add a step before going into the half gallon container. And that is I am constantly brewing um, in, if it's less than a gallon, uh, in a gallon fermenter. And above me, you can see if you're watching the video, I have a couple half gallons that look like it's just a mead with a ton, a ton of headspace. What it really is, is a half gallon or a probably two thirds gallon of mead that is going to ferment, finish, and then I'll put into a half gallon and will equal out to a half gallon um, because I lose some to sediment. So my mead mistake there was just I have two or three half gallons of mead right now that had um, headspace on them that were obviously headspace and, and that mead are going to be uh, conflicting. I kind of fixed my problem a little bit, um, which is part of my other little tip for you. If you want to alleviate, get rid of headspace, you should go through and add um, marbles to your carboy, to your glass container, whatever. Now, I will caution you with this. If you fill up your 
whole container with marbles, then you probably just need to be using a smaller container in general. If you have like maybe a half inch, two inches, or a half inch to an inch of headspace on top of your mead and you're like, I wanna get rid of that, yeah, throw some marbles in there, throw some sanitizer on them and do that. You can get them on Amazon. I'm sure there are better ways to get a bulk amount of marbles. Um, but I kind of found my problem that I made and, and tried to fix it recently with those marbles. So uh, that's been interesting. One other, the other side of this, the success I would say that I've had recently is that on the same topic of making a traditional mead, I have been doing more of that recently. Um, I actually have four different kinds of traditional mead going currently, and I'm of course gonna keep most of that as traditional but then also I'll take some off and then play around with flavors. Um, I'm getting more experience and getting better results with traditional meads because I am trying, uh, I'm trying different kinds of yeast. I'm trying different kinds of, um, you know, honey and all those various things. So uh, that that's kind of helpful in that regard. Um, and I, earlier I said I was going to talk about the yeast side of things. Um, that's a rabbit hole to get into the future because I think we could go on for another 30 minutes on yeast. Uh, and I will talk about that maybe next episode, something, I don't know, but your yeast does make a big difference on your mead making. So before you get angry and say it, you know, it doesn't, or it does, and you didn't address it, I, I will address it in the future. So, uh, yeah, there's that, but I am on fire to keep making or try to make better traditional meads. That's part of my goal. Of course, I'm gonna keep making all the weird stuff I can uh, in the meantime as well. Uh, and yeah, I've had a lot of fun with this. Um, I hope you will get out and try to make your own traditional meads. And before you go and find the craziest recipe you can, see if you can make yourself a traditional mead and get the flavor in your mouth and get the taste of what a traditional mead should be so that you can build upon that and not have to reduce down to find out what a traditional mead tastes like. So thank you guys for listening. This has been episode number nine, I think. I don't know, I could be wrong. Um, but uh, I have really enjoyed getting to make these episodes. And if you're watching this on YouTube, you're of course saw the video or seeing the video. If you are on Apple Podcasts, uh, Spotify, anything like that, you can, um, you know, you can continue to listen that way. I, I hope that you will um, hit subscribe on that if you are on one of those and, and rate. It really helps if you rate the podcast because uh, it does help it get out there a little bit more and I'd appreciate that. If you just want to support the channel, then go check out um, any of the links on YouTube or any stuff like that. Uh, I'd appreciate that. But I hope you will take some of this information and um, run with it, make your own mead, have your own fun with it. And yeah, so thank you guys for watching. I hope you have a great day. Cheers.